I was around a lot of kids' issues, and I always had an interest. I was a camp counselor, and a group of uh, uh, older women wanted to start a camp for the uh, kids at a cancer center, and so they approached me almost out of nowhere and said, would you be the head counselor uh, if we started this thing? And I, I did it one summer, and then I did it for almost all my summers for, for decades, actually. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor after law school, so I actually brought in as the counselors all of my colleagues. So about half the staff were assistant U.S. attorneys, and it really turned out to be uh, an incredible experience, obviously. Uh, because you know, I felt really a privilege to be around these kids uh, and and their families and what they were going through, but also uh, learning from it in so many ways. And then you know, you so you've gone down through. Your father was a mayor, and how did that influence you in terms of you know your your ambitions to move forward? I was it from nineteen ninety one to ninety seven, I believe. And how did that influence you personally in terms of deciding to for uh, public service? Well, I think, look, you know, you can only uh, latch on to the examples that are available to you. And for me, the examples of my, my parents were really incredible. Uh, my dad was a very um, serious guy when it came to public service. He was a, a World War II vet. Uh, he just died a, a, a year or two ago. At age 99, he was a judge until he was about 94. But he really, um, his example of, of just, you know, Loving what he did was something I really uh, saw, and I think I wanted it for myself. My mom, too, by the way. I mean, she was one of these great um, teachers that taught Spanish, French, and Latin, uh, was a favorite among my friends uh, and in our school. Uh, so I, I just had examples of people who, who were about public service in my life, and I felt like that's where I wanted to be. And so your wife is a prosecutor. How did you meet your wife? By the way, does it <laughs> terrible story. Uh, okay. So I was a federal prosecutor out of, uh, you know, pretty young. Uh, and um, but after I left, I, I, I went to work uh, in the U.S. Senate running the Senate's investigations committee for a senator, uh, Sam Nunn from Georgia. I was his chief counsel. I ran the committee. So I was up in Washington and some friends of ours actually knew I was going there and said, you know, you're, uh, there's this uh, young lady we'd like you to meet. She is a federal prosecutor in in Washington. She works at the Justice Department. We should uh, set you up. Um, and so I really, uh, you know, didn't know much about that. But then what ultimately happened is um, they never set me up. Nobody actually ever did it. And then when I called over something else, the person who was setting us up asked me how how Joan was. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, well, we were supposed to set you up with her. And then I realized that the, the folks in Washington had decided I wasn't worthy of this gal. So they had just not set us up. So I called her. I cold called her myself and told her I didn't like the fact that I wasn't worthy of her and we should go out. And then we ended up getting married. I had a 66 Mustang at the time, uh, which I sold. Uh, and she now wears that as her engagement ring uh, because that was how things went back then. But. Yeah, we met there and then we came back uh, a few years later uh, back to home. And, you know, you've gone down. I re and if I recall, I remember that it said you work with terrorism and uh, weapons of mass destruction. You're on a committee. How, how's that? <laughs> How do you go from Miami to that? Well, uh, Sam Nunn uh, ran a, the, it's called the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation. It's, it's, a, it's a committee of the U.S. Senate. It's a standing committee. Uh, I, I, I could tell you it was also... Uh, the rackets committee when Bobby Kennedy had the same job, but then I'd have to confess that Roy Cohn had the same job when it was the McCarthy committee. It's a pretty well-known committee in the Senate. And when I was there, we were looking at weapons of mass destruction. Um, back then uh, there were a million people on the internet and that we thought that was a big uh, uh, challenge at that point. So we held hearings on sort of emerging threats and perils. And my first job was to go to go to Japan because the Om Shinrikyo, which is a cult in Japan had put sarin gas into the Tokyo subway system, and it was the first. I remember that. I remember you know, it was the first deployment of chemical weapons on a civilian population. So we won. So I ended up just going around the world, meeting, um, uh, learning about how we were prepared for the next big incident, and what we could do to prepare ourselves better. It was really, honestly, the one of the most interesting jobs you could ever hope for. I had a team of people with me, and we really. 
uh, you know, learned a lot, and uh, and Washington was a, a great place to to be for a, a short period of time. You know, I remember. Do you remember the ISTC under the yeah. Nun Luger? Mem I was part of it. So yeah, I worked with Nun and Luger. I thought uh, Luger was one of the uh, Nun was is a great guy. Luger was a great guy. He passed away some years ago. Uh, and if, I think if people had listened to them more, a lot of our current challenges of security wouldn't be wouldn't be as, as, as present as they are today. Yeah, I was actually in Russia working with the ISTC at the time, going out to those those different facilities all over the place. I, I, I would meet with a bunch of Russians and they would all I remember it'd be in the morning and they'd be on one side and I'd be with my team on the other. And there'd be vodka on the table at uh, mm -hmm. 6 a.m. and. I wouldn't have a bit of it. And then they uh, turned to me and say, we were expecting Senator Nunn. Who are you? And that was, it never went well after that, but it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting time at, at, at obviously uh, at that moment in history. Yeah, no, I remember. I remember I did it for three years. So it was very, very uh, interesting. So, you know, Miami beach, I know I remember, you know, when I was younger seeing Miami vice, and I was like, oh, my God, there's a lot of stuff going on down there. The white suits, the cars, you know, the, the, the fake Daytonas. <laughs> but, you know, I, and it's changed a lot. How has it changed, in your, your opinion? From, you know, and I, I know the, that whole drug culture is different than it was. Um, it is. Yeah. Today, but how, how is it? How has it changed? From your that was point? our polyester phase. Look, <laughs> Miami is a city. Uh, and a community, Miami Beach, Miami, the whole county is really an area that is trying to find the best version of itself. And it's gone through a lot of different versions and, and different iterations. It's matured clearly. What I remember the, uh, the Miami Vice stage uh, quite well. Uh, and it was a sort of a, you know, it was it was a bit of a polyester neon stage for the city. Um, I think what's going on with the city uh, in our community is that we're sort of discovering our best version. And it is, we have become a sort of a cultural place. We, you know, uh, my city hosts Art Basel now for 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, enormous, uh, uh, you know, sort of critical mass of cultural institutions setting up shop from the Miami City Ballet to the Arch, to the Perez, to the New World Symphony, all, they just keep coming. Um, mm -hmm. We have, uh, Miami New Drama is a, is a pretty well-known outfit now. So, and they just keep showing up because there's an appetite for it. And I think it feeds on itself. And so for, for me, what has happened, I think, in South Florida is that over the last uh, 20 years and probably uh, over the last 10 for sure, and even more recently, we've developed a lot of the amenities that more serious communities uh, uh, were accustomed to, like culture. Um, we have a lot of the business amenities. We have a pretty substantial financial center in, in South Florida. We always have because we're, so, we're such a gateway to Latin America. But we've also developed other kinds of businesses and, and amenities to businesses that people expect. So we're sort of discovering who we are right now. And the pandemic has only, uh, uh, you know, while it's had obviously only uh, treachery in every way, it, you know, for us at least, it, it has forced us to explore our green spaces more, out, you know, our outdoors in ways that other, other places just don't have access to. Well, and we talked earlier about uh, when you were at Tufts and you experienced snow for the first time. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, when I, I, sh I had not visited the campus until I started as a freshman. And it was the first day there was snow. Uh, and I, um, for the first time I saw snow, it was a couple of days later. My roommates locked me out of the dormitory because I ran out in shorts and, uh, and a, sh a shirt shoeless thinking that it would just be fine to be running around. They thought it was the funniest thing in the world. I had no clue that uh, it was, you know, what it was, what it was like. And to this day, I still am not a big fan of snow. So. And uh, you were saying you took your daughter up to uh, Washington. <laughs> yeah, my daughter just started her first job. My oldest is 22. And so we just took her up to DC mm. and we, we drove through storms and ice. We drove back through storms and ice. We couldn't wait to leave. Um, I, you know, it's really a, a dreary place right now. Um, and and it and you really feel stuck inside in ways that are it's just uh, almost not normal. And they, you know, the so we talked earlier about the South Florida lifestyle, and how does that compare? Like like culturally, and I don't mean just with the snow and things, but how does a, the lifestyle compare in Florida 
at Miami Beach on Miami Beach compared to uh, the Northeast? Well, listen, I think it's certain. Look, Chicago in the summer is a is a great place to visit. Um, you know, there there are places that in certain because of the weather and the moments and the seasons are, are beautiful. Um, the one thing I think that's happened for us is that we have sort of discovered that our green space and our outside is something that you have to develop. We are in, my city's in the middle of a huge parks renaissance. Uh, there's a metric as to um, that the parks use. If you, uh, if you can walk within 10 minutes of a park, what, what percent of the population are 10 minutes of a walk away from a park? There are a few cities in the country that are at 100%. I think we're at 98%, um, which is highly, highly unusual. We, uh, we're we rebuilding all our parks. We're adding new park space. We're converting parking lots to parks. So it's very outdoorsy. We got uh, more Pilates studios, more wellness places, you know, more uh, walking promenades. We just are finishing a beach walk in our city that literally will, uh, we're, this summer we're finishing uh, the final part of it. So you'll be able to go from uh, our city's 88 blocks long, zero to 79 without leaving the water's edge on the wow. beach. Uh, and we're about to, and, and in a year, it'll go to 88th Street. Uh, and that's a, a, a walkable and bikeable promenade. And it's going to be the same on the bay side from about 17th down. So we, I'd like to, you know, have almost the entire city so you could travel it without leaving uh, Bay or Ocean. But we're trying to do these kinds of things because we think that's what people look for. Uh, and, and that's what we like. I, I mean, if you want to, you know, that, that healthy lifestyle is something that's uh, really part of who we are at this point. And, and you have the beach. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know, someone said to me that the, the kite surfers, you know, come, they all, they're all coming down because we have kite surfing. Whatever. But we have a lot of these kind of sports and amenities uh, lots of intercoastals. There's a, it's really an outdoor lifestyle. And it, uh, for a lot of people, it's been discovered during the pandemic. I, I wasn't a walker, uh, but my wife and I go on walks every day almost. And we, we can't decide often which, uh, which you know, route we want to take because they're all so interesting. We're opening up bike paths. We're converting parklets into outdoor dining because that's been something we've had to do because of the pandemic. We're going to continue that because we think that, you know, moving things outside is, is, a, is you know, the restaurants seem to really love it uh, and, and we do as well. So we're trying to do everything we can to sort of optimize and exploit what are, I think, our, our natural gifts while adding on all these other cultural amenities, which create a real, you know, some, you know, something to do that's interesting every day. No, it's great. And, you know, talk to the audience about, you know, the so coming from Silicon Valley, you know, I hear about Miami almost every day. And they talk about uh, all the great opportunities that are here. They talk about the tax situations a lot less. So from your perspective, what's, what's you know, the, you know, and I looked at just the average price of a place is like $570,000 compared to 2.X million in Palo Alto. Well, I mean, listen, I, I spent about 10 years in the Florida legislature, in the House and the Senate, so I sort of followed a lot of the regulatory framework of the state. We, we are obviously a business-friendly state. We don't have a state income tax. We never will. Uh, we got rid of the intangible tax some years ago. Um, so for us, it is, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of people, that's something that they're attracted to. I don't think that's a reason you just come because you've got to, nobody should, you know, you can't, you can't be paid to live in a place you don't want to be, obviously. So there's got to be more than just a favorable tax policy. I think what, what is happening is we are becoming a live, work, play community, not just my city, but I think the region in a sense that there is a, you know, how do you create town centers that you can walk or bike to? How do you create, uh, you know, housing stock that is diverse enough uh, to really support different lifestyles? My city, it's, uh, you know, you talk about a uh, half a million dollar price. We we have we're we're building a workforce housing for the arts community in my in my city, uh, but we do have uh, no shortage of, of, of you know, really expensive homes on some of the islands and just throughout the city. We have a pretty diversified uh, housing stock, but you have a lot of access to that. But I think for a lot of the folks that are interested in coming, well, maybe the lifestyle there has to be more than just that uh, because you've got to run a business or you've got to have access to things you need. 
you know, 10 minutes to the airport is a really good thing in most places in Dade County. That's how long it takes. Um, having uh, the kinds of financial. Well, tell you, after being in California, oh my God, my commute to go to my office could be two hours in the morning. Right. Yeah, well, by the way, I, I, you know, I live on, I don't, uh, my law firm and I'm a lawyer is, uh, is in, is in, uh, is on, is in downtown Miami. It's about a 10 minute commute for me. Um, you know, so it's pretty easy. My wife uh, works as an assistant U.S. attorney. The courthouse is right there also. I mean, everything is pretty easy. Uh, and I think that's a sort of a real selling point. But I also think that people like what they can do here. I mean, I really think that that's, uh, you know, the idea that you can you can live and see and play uh, and, you know, in a, in a community like ours is really something special. And I think that's probably that's something that's been a little bit discovered during the pandemic. Um, but I don't think it's simply because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, things have changed during this pandemic for sure. What about, what about this class A office buildings? Because I deal with a lot of large companies all over the world. And I know that you're really focused on, on that environment. What's happened in terms of those office buildings and what kind of support for the tech companies coming into Miami beach? What kind of support does the government give them? Uh, from well, we, we, you know, we've had, listen, we, we're a city that we're about a little over a hundred years old and we're a barrier Island built on limestone. So we're, we don't have room to expand. So we either uh, redo or revise or redevelop. And we're also a community that really loves our historic background our art deco architecture. So we're, we navigate a lot of pole stars, uh, but we're but we real we realize, and I think it's important to me that having a diverse housing uh, office stock is really important because there are going to be people who I'd rather them walking or biking to work than having to commute uh, uh, over the bay, um, and I think so. That's important to us. We've already got a few projects already. Uh, Starward Capital is building; it's almost completed its uh, Class A office building. I think it's occupied. Uh, he's certainly done a great job in building this in, the, in, in really in the middle of what is a, essentially an arts district in our city in Collins Park. It's around the corner from, uh, uh, you know, a W. Uh, I think the uh, Bulgari has just decided it wants to be there and Amon is going down the street. It's become really a, a Satai is there. We have the Miami City of L.A. We have uh, museums and, and promenades. And now he's uh, building there. We, we just approved a project to be built in Terminal Island, which is a sort of a little island at the foot of our city that the Related is doing. Uh, we are actually putting some of, we, we put a bid out for people uh, to offer ways to work on some of our parking lots to build a Class A office building. Um, we try to create a sense of a concierge a service. We, we, we think these are good developments for our city. Uh, we think that they offer our, our residents uh, the ability to be near where they work. Uh, we also think that they're, you know, they tend to be very uh, cultural in a sense that they they like having those things around them. I think that's something Starwood's probably going to like having a cultural center uh, across the street. So we think that that's a good accommodation of different things. We want more Class A, not because we're looking just to get wealthier people here, but because we're trying to give our residents uh, the ability to live, work, and play in their own communities. And you can't do that if uh, if there's not a sufficient Class A office space. So it, I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think uh, it's catching on pretty quickly. So I think we're going to have more of it, especially since we've offered some we, – we've certainly we've certainly put out an offer for parking lot plans to see how we can convert some of our own properties into Class A. Yeah, you know, I was I, – over the last week, I've been on some conferences – some WhatsApp with some of the uh, wealthiest Bitcoin folks on the planet. One of them's worth uh, about $52 billion. And I happen to be part of that group. And one of them uh, just committed some money to Miami. And, uh, you know, and we were talking about Miami Beach. I'm in conversation with them every day. I mean, this, these are, this is a group that's probably worth $150 billion in total. Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies from all over the world. But you're getting an incredible amount of attention. When I talk to the, the startups, when I talk to the tech companies, and I'm myself, I'm an AI and quantum computing. That's what I like. Write a lot. I've written about 120 articles in the last year. And the companies, they're coming down. They want to change their lives. The taxes, too. 
the whole issue we talked about tax. I mean, you get killed in California. It's just crazy. Well, well that's more expensive, you know. Listen, I look. I think that you know. I look at it this way. Um, the goal is for us to create a more diverse economy. Frankly, I mean, we can't simply have an economy that's based on uh, uh, hospitality. Uh, that is, that's not a, a stable. Uh, when a hurricane comes and you got to cancel reservations, or or when other states have downturns in the economy, or or the or the dollar, you know, or, or foreign currencies are down, all of a sudden people don't travel as much, and and you don't have your hotel rate, and therefore you don't have your resort tax rate. So for me, it's about diversifying our own economy into more of a knowledge based economy, uh, while we have the hospitality industry, because I think actually. The hospitality industry really supports a lot of the amenities that people love. And they really, I mean, having having access to museums and culture and sporting venues and all this other stuff, it really is an exciting life when, when you know, when you go from Art Basel to the, the, the Food and Wine Festival in just a few weeks and all of a sudden other things are showing up. It's always amazing to me who's coming to our city and what events are here. Mm-hmm. So I think that's important. But having a diverse economy and a knowledge base, and, I, and I'll say this, I think probably when I was in the legislature 20 years ago, we didn't have um, the academic uh, foundation to support as much of these uh, tech, uh, you know, industries as, as, as we do now. But now between University of Miami has made incredible strides uh, in so many areas. Uh, Florida National University uh, has also, we have lots of partnerships with them. Miami-Dade College uh, is a place it's, a, it's the biggest transformer of people in the country. It a, has 180,000 students, and it's almost 70% of them are uh, you never come the first person in their family to go to college. So we're we're upgrading our whole workforce as well to make it capable of servicing uh, a lot of these industries that that want that. Well, I, you know, the investors when the investors start to come, and I got to tell you, Mary Gelber, it's one of my friends, very good friend of mine, is a top VC in Silicon Valley. Five years ago, when I told him about Miami, I told him about South Florida. He said, I've never been there. And this is Stanford, Harvard grad, MBA uh, Stanford. I actually had a conversation with him last week. He says, what's going on with Miami? What's going on with Miami Beach? What's happening down there? Why is everybody talking about it? And then, you know, the one thing we talk about all the cultural things, but I got to tell you on the side with the startups that we're dealing with, they like to swim in the ocean. <laughs> Swim in the ocean. You go to the Pacific, it's cold. And, you know, swimming in the ocean, boating, the Everglades, the floor, being able to travel to the Keys or Disney and do things. There's so much opportunity. Gas is cheaper here. Food yeah. is cheaper here. It's and by the way, our restaurant uh, game has improved immensely. Uh, I mean, I was just at a Carbone Italian uh, is a, is a uh, it was a New York restaurant that they moved down here, uh, and and you know Joe Stone Crab. We, we you could just go down the list, uh, and a lot You're of really the, hungry uh, now with this Joe Stone Crab stuff. <laughs> I, by the way, can I just, they have they have it in other places, but I still prefer the one here. I, I, look, a lot of it is we have upped our game a lot, uh, but the truth of the matter is, I just think that it's you know. I think we're a more serious place now in, in every way. And I think people see that that whole, um, you know, you don't want to be in a place where where you don't have a, a balanced life. And I think uh, for us, it has it, we have discovered that we can balance our lives here better because we have access to so many things. I line I always use is, uh, sorry, repeat it. I'm sure you've heard me say it is, you know, people uh, save money all year long or for years to spend three days in our city. And we get to wake up here every single day uh, and with access to all these wonderful uh, amenities, the outdoors, the beach, uh, everything. And it is it is a year-long uh, idea. And it is something that I think a lot of people who are here, uh, probably many are, are, are always appreciated. But I think now, especially during the pandemic, we really have begun to embrace it in ways that um, are, are very obvious. Yeah, I have companies right now. We have 17 portfolio companies in AI and quantum. Some of the companies up to $20 million in revenue. So we got companies that, you know, they're looking for homes. They're from all over the world again. And they look at the U.S. as this really fashion, this opportunity to grow companies. And now with this decentralization, you don't have to work. You can be, 
you can have a company in Silicon Valley, but you don't have to live there, right? I mean, and, and a lot of, I mean, look, that's, look, there's no silver lining to this pandemic, obviously. But one thing it did is it did force people to change their work styles. Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden, uh, working remotely, while a lot of folks were doing it, it wasn't as mainstream as it is now. Now everybody accepts it as something that's a real possibility. And I think if you could work remotely and be here, why wouldn't you? I mean, you know, why, why would you want to be somewhere else? So for me, it's really, um, you know, we see that happening. So, yeah, I, I mean, and again, the house price is so much cheaper. I mean, you look at it, my friends. Are yeah, yeah, by the way, uh, half a million dollars is not cheaper to a lot of people. Uh, yeah, but in the valley, when it's two point seven million, you know what I mean? It's crazy. And still, you know, I mean, look. Let me let me just say we're we're still intent on it, on addressing all of the issues of our of our communities. I mean, workforce housing is a challenge because a lot of businesses that come here may have a CEO who's very wealthy, but there are going to be other folks looking for more modestly priced places and you need to have workforce housing. You need to have a diverse inventory of housing. And I, you know, we're doing some in our city. I, my colleague, the mayor of Miami, he's a really good guy and has been all over this. Francis Suarez was really talking a lot about workforce housing in his community because it's so much bigger. And frankly, there's a lot of economic disparity there. So we are trying to up our game, not just in sort of the, you know, the cultural stuff and the things that people might uh, want to spend a lot of money uh, or or might enjoy, but really trying to create a more uh, resilient community from every perspective. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I I think you've done a phenomenal job. I love the lifestyle, and as I said, I'm up in uh, Wellington, and I just can't believe it. Honestly, a lot of, a lot of I mean, polo players in Wellington. A lot of polo players. It's a beautiful environment. You know, I love Miami. I love Miami Beach. I think you've got incredible things to offer. I hear the tech companies because we're right in that community relocating from Silicon Valley down. And it's great to have, you know, Miami Beach with open arms, welcome them. Listen, there's always challenges everywhere. But when you got less taxes, aff more affordable housing, and, I, you know, half a million is not cheap. But compared to the Valley, <laughs> you can't get anything. You know, I don't know of any place that's half a million dollars. None. There's no studio that I know of. So having those kind of environments, having people welcome, uh, beautiful lifestyle. I guess there's like 300 days of sunshine in, yeah. in Florida. 300 days. In California, it's gray. If you're out there right now, it's rainy and gray and, and, and tightly coupled. Gas prices are higher. So there's incredible benefits to Miami Beach incredible benefits to having uh, yourself as a mayor to be able to uh, welcome them with open arms. So, you know, guys, listen, this is Gary speaking to you. There's incredible opportunities. Look at Miami beach, look at Miami. There's a lot of things that you can do there. There's a great opportunity to build your companies there. And Mayor Gelber is doing a lot to be able to make life a lot better. Mayor Gelber, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Sorry about some of the technical issues in the beginning. Uh, but um, I appreciate your time. Very good luck. And thank you. And uh, and we want to help. So if you're interested in coming down, let me know. We're, we're here to help and we uh, we welcome you. Okay. Uh, as soon as they write me, <laughs> we'll start sending it down. We have a lot of companies that we deal with that are talking about it today. So we'll forward those over. Thank you, sir. I pre thank appreciate your time. And thank you for joining uh, GSD Presents. My name's Gary Fowler. I'm your host. Thanks again. I'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.